Good evening, Professor Lewis. Good evening. Well, the first question is more of an alibi to me than to you. Uh, I understand that you'd rather not refer to any political, current political uh, issues. I would prefer not to do Why, so by the way, in the I present mean? context. Why, by the way, if I may ask? Why? I think it's easier to discuss politics in a situation where one controls the development of the discussion. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, then we'll go to history, and if you feel that I'm trying to trick you, you you'll know what to do. Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't do any such no, thing. No, God forbid. Let me first of all ask about peace. Yes. How would you, or how would the Arabs, define this term, peace? You you mean the English word peace, or the Arabic word? Or the Hebrew word so. peace in Arabic, which has got two con connotations. Well, as you know, there are two different words which are used for peace in Arabic, salah and salam, and I have observed over the years a great deal of rather metaphysical interpretation of these two terms, most of which I must say, frankly, I find beside the point. Um, in, in the Muslim and more particularly the Arab world at the present time, I think people use these terms peace and war in much the same sense as anyone else. They have now accepted the normal political discourse of the international community in this respect. I think one has also to add that the words salam and sulh in Arabic have at various times changed their meanings. The word which is normally used for a peace treaty, for example, is sulh. Um, if you look in school textbooks in Arabic, the Treaty of Versailles and the Treaty of Utrecht and the various other major treaties of European history are always called sulh. Uh, salam in the past had a more religious meaning. It was used of um, peace and well-being in this world and the next, more particularly in the next. It occurred in greetings. It was not normally used very much as the opposite of war. Um, it had more of a sense of salvation than of peace. That's not uh, something you sign with other people, no, but rather no. with your God, perhaps. Quite so, yes. And um, in modern times, it has come to be used more and more in the sense of peace in a sort of political military sense. Uh, for example, the Arabic translations of Tolstoy's War and Peace use the word salam, not sol. Mm -hmm. Sol has the sense of putting an end to war, making peace. Um, it's the transition from a state of war to a state of peace. And that's why it's the word which is normally used for a, a peace treaty. Mm -hmm. How would you... Um define the basis for the Arabs or the Muslims' attitudes towards uh, foreigners? Well, that's a very large question, but I take it you mean the traditional attitude, yes. because there again, things have changed very much in the modern world. The traditional attitude was based on a religious classification. Um, all societies have divided the world into us and them. <coughs> Greeks and barbarians, Jews and Gentiles, citizens and aliens, and so on. The, for Muslims, traditionally, the basic distinction is by belief. And the world is divided religiously into Muslims and non-Muslims, politically into subjects of the Muslim state and outsiders. The non-Muslims are further divided into those who profess a revealed religion, which in practice means Christians and Jews, and those who are not, those who do not, and the rules are different in the two cases. Those who do not profess uh, revealed religion, how are they treated? Well, according to the strict letter of the law, they are to be given the choice of Islam or death. Uh, death is usually trend, um, commuted to some lesser penalty, though it could have been applied, but this has not been the rule for a very long time. Now, in your book, there is uh, an article on the changes in the conception of the word or the name Palestine yes. through the generation. I'm saying the word or the name. How would you define it? Well, it's a word, of course. It's also a name. It, it begins as an adjective. The earliest uses of Palestine are adjectival. Not noun. It's not a noun, but an adjective. Uh, as the final syllable indicates, the ending I-N-E is usually an adjectival one. Of, uh, of a, a Philistine nature? Um, no, it's a, it's, it first appears as an adjective in apposition to Syria. The phrase which appears in some Greek and Latin texts is Syria-Palestina, which means that part of Syria which had 
a long time previously been inhabited by the Philistines. Um, the much earlier form, of course, which is uh, Philistia, the land of the Philistines, Hebrew Peleshet, and similar forms in other ancient Middle Eastern languages. But that is not the same as Palestine. It's interesting, in the English authorized version of the Bible, Peleshet is translated Palestine. But in the modern versions, the revised version, Palestine disappears and is replaced by Philistia. Now, the modern use of the word Palestine, and I'm not yet talking about this day and age, mm -hmm. has become more political, especially with the British mandate. Yes, it goes through several phases. Um, the name Palestine seems to have become the official name of this country after the suppression of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, when there was, I suppose you might call a, a, a deliberate policy of de-Judaization, so that what had until then been called Judea was renamed Palestina, and what had until then been called Jerusalem was renamed Aelia Capitolina. And uh, Palestine remained under Roman Byzantine administration as the name of a province. And then uh, two provinces, Palestina Prima, Palestina Secunda, and then three provinces. When the Arabs conquered this region in the seventh century, they retained the name Palestine, which became Palestine, um, but only for Palestina Prima. Palestina Secunda was called Urdun, which is Jordan. Jordan, yes. So there were two names in this area, Palestine and Urdun, which are, of course are normally translated as Palestine and Jordan. The frontier between them was not, did not run north-south but east-west. And these were merely districts of the province of Damascus. After that, the name Palestine disappeared. When the Crusaders arrived in these parts, it had already passed out of common use. The Crusaders didn't use it, of course. They called it the Holy Land. Terra Sancta. It reappeared about the time of the Renaissance in Europe, when there was a, a, a fashion for things classical and Greek and Latin names again come into common usage. And from that time onwards, Palestine is the name commonly used in Europe, though not in Palestine. Um, it was first given an official form with the British mandate and ended with the British mandate. And uh, is there, would you make a definition between the use of the uh, adjective, as you say, Palestine and Palestinian? Yes, I mean, Palestine ceased to be an adjective a long time ago. Um, what I said was that it begins, it makes its first appearance as an adjective. But already in Roman times, it is used as a substantive. And once Palestine becomes a noun, then you need a further adjectival form. In Latin was palestinensis, and uh, modern English is palestinian. In other words, uh, now I'm not trying to trick you, but I really want to know if you make a definition between a Palestinian state as such and a Palestinian people as such. Well, the Palestinian state does not exist. Uh, the Palestinian people undoubtedly does exist. And that, I think, is a distinction of some significance. Now, how would you say what are the common traits to Islam and Judaism? And well, may, may I just uh, elaborate a little? And what are the political significance of those traits? Well, there are many common traits between Islam and Judaism, perhaps the most important, or at least the most obvious, of which is that both are legal religions. And both are religions which have a whole code of laws regulating not only belief and worship, which are commonly recognized as belonging to the sphere of religion, but a whole series of other things like marriage and divorce and inheritance and food, cooking and eating, and so on. Um, this is not the case with Christianity, for example. It is a characteristic which Judaism and Islam share. And this also has political implications in that the examples which I gave relate to the law of personal status, marriage, divorce, inheritance. But uh, both have certain political rules as well incorporated in the holy law, in the Sharia for Muslims or the Halakha for Jews. The, the important difference between the two is that Islam has been a religion in power for the whole of its 14 centuries of existence, whereas Judaism has been out of power for a very long time. It is now finding itself again, 
for the first time after a discontinuity of almost two millennia associated with the institutions of power. And this, of course, creates problems for the tackling of which there is a certain lack of experience. And with Islam, does that, does that mean that politically uh, religion has become the law of the state to a certain extent? Traditionally, religion was the law of the state. That's to say, in traditional Muslim states, there was no formally recognized law other than the law of Islam. What would, in, in, in Jewish term, would be defined the as halakha? Equivalent of halakha, yes. Uh, there were, of course, other laws, but these were de facto, not de jure. That's to say, the will of the ruler obviously had the force of law in practice, though not of theory. And there was always a certain amount of customary law, tribal law, local law, and the like. But none of this was officially recognized. The only duly constituted law administered by recognized tribunals and properly appointed judges was the holy law of Islam. And that remained true in virtually all Muslim countries of advanced civilization until the 19th century when you get the beginnings of a, a sort of secularization through the introduction of European legal notions and European legal norms. But then Again, in the middle, or even after the middle of the 20th century, you get the uh, fundamentalism growing in many Islamic uh, Arab countries. Uh, how do you explain that? Oh, well, indeed, it's growing. And while the basic meaning of this is the desire to undo the westernizing, secularizing changes of the last century or so and return to a Sharia state. Um, if you look at the writings of the fundamentalists, it's quite clear that this is the main issue as they see it. Um, not certain other matters which we have regarded as more important, but which in the context of Islamic fundamentalism are trivial and secondary. In uh, one of your articles in that book on Orientalism, there is an, almost an, what I would dare say, and I hope you won't be angry at me, emotional outburst against uh, a certain Dr. Ahmad Saeed. Not uh, Ahmad, Edward. Sorry. Uh, who, in fact, attacked you more than mm -hmm. once by, by misquoting from your books and articles. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the, the article in question is a response to an emotional outburst. Yes. By him? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> some, some rubbed, some of it rubbed in, probably. Mm -hmm. And that was an article where he, he uh, I think, uh, claim that you are using sexual terminology uh, yes, right. in speaking yes. about the Arab world. Yes. How, can, you, can you explain that? No, well, I didn't, of course. I mean, this was his invention. Uh, there are no limits to the powers of interpretation of a really determined man. Yeah, but he's not the only one, is he, of, of the Arab Orientalists who claim that he's not Western Orientalists. Oriental well, he claims to be. No, he doesn't. So what is he? I think he would regard that as an insult. Why? Uh, because for him, Orientalist is a term of abuse. Why? He regards this as evil. It's a certain philosophy which is, of which he is by no means the only exponent. It's people who say roughly this, you, meaning the Western world, you have robbed us of our present, you have endangered and compromised our future, and now you are trying to invade and pillage our past. In other words, our culture, our history, belong to us, and outsiders have no right to concern themselves. It's like, like a property. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, of which only a limited amount is available. And if they do so, they must do so for ulterior motives. And then, of course, comes the quest for the ulterior motives. Uh, you had the same question when the first Western archaeologists came to this part of the world and started digging up ancient tombs, uh, which the occupants of the country had never thought of doing. Now, why would these people come from thousands of miles away, spend a lot of money, risk their necks, uh, make enormous efforts in order to dig up a lot of old graves? There must be something hidden in this. Uh, this is basically the approach. Yeah, well, so we've got Orientalism mixed with paranoia <laughs> as everything uh, else. Yes, I would think that's... Uh... Thank you very much, Professor Bernard-Lewis. Thank you. Thank you.